Okay. So thank you. It's a, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. I've been enjoying this meeting and the discussions tremendously. Um, so like Emily, I'm worried that I have uh, too many slides, so I'll, I'll talk quickly. Uh, but this, this talk is largely based on uh, an essay I've written uh, um, um, uh, with the same name. Uh, and uh, you can find a link to the essay and as well as these slides on my webpage. So if you just Google it, um, it shouldn't be hard to find. Um, so the essay explores the way we think about mathematical understanding. Um, if you, you know, talk to mathematicians, they'll tell you that uh, you know, uh, one, one of the key goals of modern mathematics is to acquire a certain type of conceptual understanding. Um, and I've never seen a precise definition of what it means to be conceptual, but there are a lot of associations that seem to be you know, uh, commonly associated with it. Uh, so certainly uh, you know, high on the list is being algebraic. So conceptual mathematics is, uses a lot of algebraic structures. Uh, uh, more generally, you know, conceptual means having the right concepts or the right definitions. And you know, as mathematics evolves, the, the definitions get more complicated, but having the right definitions is important. Uh, it also depends on having uh, conceptual scaffolding, like building on a lot of, a lot of theory. Um, typically, or very often, conceptual is, is contrasted with, with computational or calculation. Right? They're, they're, they're held to be opposed. And that can be in a couple of senses, right? So if you're working through a long calculation, there's a feeling that you, know, you, can, you can follow the calculation line by line, but you're losing sight or losing a sense of what's really going on. Right? So sometimes calculation can kind of obscure understanding. Or sometimes that, you know, when you're in a calculation, there's really no understanding to be had. It's just a calculation. Right? So and anyhow, at that stage, it's, you're not being conceptual anymore. Um, and another thing that's commonly associated with being conceptual is finding you know, kind of relationships between concepts in different, different uh, domains of, of mathematics. Um, and some of these aspects, you can find uh, traces of going back to the, the 19th century. Uh, so, you know, in the Disquisitiones uh, 1801, uh, Gauss was talking about Wilson's theorem. There's a lovely quote where he says, in our opinion, truths of this kind should be drawn from the notions involved rather than uh, from notations. So it's, you know, notions or ideas rather than kind of symbols, syntax, calculation, notation. So it's concepts, you know, rather than calculation. Um, there's an unpublished, uh, in, in, in Galois, in his collected works, you can find uh, an unpublished manuscript, it's about two pages long where he's talking about his work in Galois theory uh, and talking about you know, how the calculations get, get out of hand. Uh, but then he says, for these kinds of questions, there exist considerations of a metaphysical nature which hover over the calculations and often make them useless. Uh, and then he goes on, he, he starts talking about Apple's theory of elliptic functions. And he says, for, for all that creates the beauty and at the same time, the difficulty of this theory uh, is that one has ceaselessly to indicate the path of the analysis and to anticipate the results without ever being able to carry them out. And I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but I think he's kind of referring to the fact that, you know, when you're talking about uh, elliptic functions, you know, very often you can't calculate them, but still the theory tells you how to reason about them without needing to actually calculate them. Um, a similar quote I like from Dietekind uh, in 1871 in his presentation of the theory of ideals. He says that the goal of his theory is to seek proofs based immediately on fundamental characteristics rather than on calculation. And indeed, to construct the theory in such a way that is able to predict the results of calculation without having to carry them out. And so for Dedekind, uh, you know, fundamental characteristics is often you know, axiomatic characterizations of the essential properties, right, rather than the particular constructions that, uh, that are involved. Um, and you know, from a philosophical, logical, you know, computer science engineering point of view, I mean, it's not that mysterious. You know, when we talk about conceptual mathematics, it's, it's a kind of conceptual engineering and information management. I mean, mathematics gets very complicated. There are a lot of details. There's a lot of information to keep track of. And so, you know, conceptually, it's, it sort of gives you a body of methods that helps make information salient uh, when, when you need it. Uh, but when, there's, you know, when, when information threatens to overwhelm you, like there's too much detail, uh, it kind of tucks away the, the, the details that are irrelevant to what you're thinking about and, and provides clean interfaces between different modules so that you know, different people can work on different parts. And you can use parts from, from you know, one theory. One, you, know, you can use a theorem without really understanding um, the proof. Um, and, and similarly, you know, this idea of, uh, of having uh, you know, different connections between uh, different branches is simply that you know, different representations of data let you do different things with it. Um, so this dovetails nicely with, with, uh, with Johan's presentation. I mean, we, we didn't coordinate, but I think the reason that his presentation was compelling is that you know, he, made, he made a good case, I think, that you know, lean helps you do things that, that are essential to, to the mathematics. Right? These are things that mathematics wants you to do. 
Um, and by describing it in this kind of mundane terms, I'm not trying to demystify or make the, the mathematics seem any less wonderful. Uh, I mean, on the contrary, I think, trying to think about how it works and you know, what it means to be conceptual and why we care, why we want conceptual mathematics um, um, is important to help us understand you know, why mathematics is, is, is so wonderful. Um, but anyhow, so the, 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 the point of the essay was to you know, give you this characterization of conceptual understanding um, and then discuss a number of results, contemporary results in mathematics that challenge that conception um, and in part, uh, you know, because they use computers, they, they, they make essential use of computation um, in, you know, in interesting and, and novel ways. Um, so I'll do that, uh, and then I'll kind of give some uh, historical uh, 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 insight. And then I'll, you know, draw some morals from that, and then I'll draw some even bigger morals uh, after that. Um, so the four challenges that are discussed in the paper uh, are these. Uh, they're all from discrete uh, geometry. Um, and I'll run through them quickly because the details aren't so, I mean, the details are interesting. They're not, they're not so important. It's more the character uh, of the results. Um, but the first result uh, I talk about in the paper is, you know, the Kepler conjecture, or, you know, now maybe we should call it Hell's theorem because it's, it's no longer a conjecture. It's a theorem. But it's, the result, I think, is well known to, to people in this audience that uh, the optimal density of you know, packing equally sized spheres uh, in space uh, is the one attained by the, the face-centered cubic packing. You know, it's the one that you would naively use if you were you know, packing grapefruit into a box or layering cannonballs. And the story is that, uh, uh, you know, that in, in 1611, uh, you know, Kepler just asserted without proof that this, that this packing is, uh, is optimal. Uh, and it wasn't proved uh, until 1998 where, uh, when, when uh, Thomas Hales uh, with, uh, in part, uh, with a student, Sam, Samuel Ferguson, did uh, an important part in his dissertation. Uh, but uh, so uh, they announced a proof in uh, 1998. And the proof relies on computation in essential ways. It, it, it relies on a combinatorial, an enumeration of certain combinatorial structures known as tame graphs. And to each one, you get uh, um, some you know, nonlinear constraints. Uh, and then you have to sort of relax them to linear constraints and then show that the, the, those constraints are, are infeasible. Right? And each of these components uh, makes essential use of computation. Um, in, in, you know, in, a very, in a very interesting way. Uh, and you know, frustrated by referees, uh, you know, Tom launched an effort to formally verify the result, and that was finally completed in 2014. But even setting the verification um, aside, you know, just the, the use of computation in, in, in getting the result initially, I think, you know, marks it as, as, uh, as, as, a, as a computational result. Uh, moving from spheres, you can talk about packing tetrahedra into space, what's the best way to pack tetrahedra into space. Uh, and you know, on the on the right there, you can see some some you know, some packings of tetrahedra. Uh, here's the record. Uh, so you know, there's a packing of equally um, uh, equally sized regular tetrahedral Euclidean space that reaches that density, so 4,000 over 4671. Um, and you know, there's a a, a nice history there. Um, so there's a, a paper in 2006 by John Conway and Salvatore Torcato, where you know they 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 raise the problem, discuss it, and they just start mucking around and trying different things, and they come up with a, with a certain density. They come up with a certain packing. Uh, but when you think about this, this is an optimization problem. You're looking for an optimal packing, and you know, it's kind of infinite dimensional. But you, know, you can kind of uh, uh, come up with you know, finite dimensional templates. You can say, well, let's look for you know, uh, solutions of this form you know, with various parameters and then optimize for those particular parameters. Uh, in 2009, Sharon Glatzer and a group, so she's a chemical engineer, um, um, they use Monte Carlo simulations of, you know, sort of putting, putting a, a tetrahedra in a box and then kind of jiggling it. And then as you jiggle it, you kind of sh sh uh, make the box smaller. Um, and there's even a, a, an ergodic theoretic explanation of why you would expect, you know, that to find good packings. But it does, in practice, find good packings. Uh, and so they, you know, they, they were able to break the record with those techniques. And the final result is, is uh, you know, comes out of her group. And it uses a parameterized family, family but if I'm remembering correctly, you know, at the end, they then kind of used simulations to make sure that there was, you know, no uh, improvement, uh, improvement nearby. Okay, so the next result uh, discussed in the paper goes back to spheres, but then moves to higher dimensions. Uh, so this is the, uh, uh, and, and by the way, these are roughly in chronological order of the, of the, of the results that I'm stating. Uh, so this is the, the celebrated result that uh, the optimal density uh, of eight dimensional sphere packing is the one attained by the E8 lattice and the optimal density of a 24-dimensional sphere packing is uh, attained by the leech lattice. Um, and so there's you know, a little bit more of a history, a little bit more to say here. Um, you know, so I've learned you know, from, from talks 
by Akshay and surveys by Henry Cohen that you know, remarkably little is known about optimal sphere packings in higher dimensions. Uh, but it's not, not for lack of, of trying. Um, but you know, E8 and leech lattice have for a long time been known to provide remarkably efficient packings in eight and 24 dimensions. Um, and there was a breakthrough in 2003 when uh, Henry Cohn and Noam Elkies uh, showed that you could use Fourier analysis um, and you know, obtain upper bounds on, on, you know, on, on the dimension of packings in, in higher dimensions by, by producing explicit functions with certain properties. Um, and then using, they used numerical methods to produce such functions and you know, gave, found the best known bounds for dimensions four to 36. Um, and you know, in the calculation at dimension eight and 24, you know, the results were, were very, very close to the results that were achieved by the E8 and the leech lattice. And so that held out hope that if you could just find exactly the right functions, um, then you could get, uh, you could show that those, those bounds are sharp. Um, and moreover, um, numeric calculations by Cohn and Miller um, uh, with these functions gave more hints as to what these uh, magic functions uh, would look like. Uh, but in 2016, it was, uh, it was Vyazovska who, 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 who managed to do it. Um, uh, uh, so she uh, constructed a, a magic function that, that, that achieved the density uh, in E8. Uh, and the construction was a real, I mean, it, it was just amazing. It was a, a tour de force of, it used you know, great deep insights and understanding of, of you know, special functions and modular forms and, and new ideas, together with a lot of experimentation, computation, guesswork, uh, and she managed to pull it off. Uh, and then within a week of, uh, of the announcement, uh, so uh, uh, Cohn, Kumar, Miller, and Redchenko joined her and together they were able to extend the techniques to get the leech lattice um, as well. Um, and then finally, the, uh, uh, the, the last result that I mentioned in the paper is the Keller conjecture. Um, so I, I've stolen these, uh, these, these pictures from Marianne Hulla, uh, a friend of mine. Um, but so if I ask you, you know, can you, can you pack squares into space, into, you know, can you tile a plane with squares in such a way that no two squares share a common edge? I mean, the answer is clearly no. I mean, you can sort of put down a square and then kind of jiggle the one next to it. But then you kind of have to fill in a corner. You have no choice. And then, you know, kind of the blue, the blue edges, you know, they, they kind of share exactly that edge. Um, if I ask you about, well, what about three space? And if you think about it a little bit, you know, you can convince yourself that in three space, you can't do it either. You know, you kind of put down a cube and then you put down a cube next to it. Maybe you, you move it forward so that they're not sharing a face. But then you've got to stick another one there in that corner. And then you've got a little corner there and you've got no choice. You've got to fill in a cube on top. And so, you know, at the blue, at the blue faces, you've got no choice but to wedge in a cube that's going to share a face. Um, so, you know, Keller in 1930 conjectured that this is true in any dimension, right, uh, for every n. Uh, remarkably, um, it's false uh, in dimensions eight and above, but it's true up to dimension seven. Um, so here again, the history was uh, so uh, uh, 1940 Perron showed that the conjecture is true up to six dimensions, uh, but then there was a lot of work. It sounds like a you know a, a continuous problem, but uh, um, but you can reduce it to a discrete problem, uh, and in fact to a statement about finite graphs. Uh, and in fact, for every n, you can reduce it to a problem about the non-existence of a of a of a clique in a certain very large graph. Uh, in 1992, Ligarius and Shore remarkably showed that, that that surprisingly that the theorem is false. There's a crazy packing in ten dimensions. You know, uh, way of arranging uh, cubes in 10 dimensions where no two cubes share a common face. Uh, 2002, John Mackey got it down to uh, uh, eight and above, uh, which left seven as the only open case. In 2019, um, so Brukensia, Kula, Mackey, and uh, Narvaez uh, showed that the conjecture is true at uh, n equals seven, so there is no weird uh, packing. And they used a SAT solver, so it's a propositional satisfiability solver. Um, and then they used to need to use all kinds of uh, clever techniques to cut down the search space and, and show that there was no, um, uh, no such, uh, no such uh, uh, tiling by higher dimensional cubes. Right, so, um, you know, these are, I, I tried to choose results that are, that they're cool, they're clearly good mathematics, they're, they're clearly, you know, interesting ideas, uh, but they don't neatly fit the conceptual mold. Uh, in part, they don't build on a whole lot of theory, you know, you can kind of read the papers, and, you know, with, 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 you know, a few weeks of effort, you can sort of get the background and understand what's going on in the papers. Um, they don't require, you know, large scaffolding of algebraic definitions. But most saliently, they use computers in, in central ways and in markedly different ways. I mean, numeric calculation, symbolic calculation, there's optimization, there's simulation, there's search. Um, so it's not, you know, just one central use of it, but they all make use of computers in, in different, different ways. Okay. 
Um, and so, you know, I kind of, in, in, in the essay, I kind of run through, you know, mathematicians' reactions. I mean, it's easiest to dismiss the, the tetrahedra problem because there's nothing special about 4,000 over 4, 4671. It's not optimal. You know, you just kind of muck around and here's the best one I found. Uh, and so, you know, I think mathematicians often feel that this is kind of experimental mathematics, and sometimes they mean this as kind of an insult, a term of derision. Um, but, but it doesn't have to be, right? I, I think, you know, there's, there's something to me just really exhilarating about thinking about packing tetrahedra. I mean, you know, I mean, so, you know, I mean, Tom and, and, and Akshay will tell you that packing spheres is, is hard enough, but at least they're round, right? I mean, how, how, would, how, how do you even start thinking about packing tetrahedra efficiently in, in, into space? Right. And, and what we love about John Conway is that, you know, you, you, can, think about, you can think about anything, right? any problem, just, just, just think about it and come up with something to say. So there's kind of like this fearless creativity, you know, in the result that is really impressive, but it doesn't feel like core mathematics, though. Right? And so that's, that's, that's really the point. They're not judgments of the value of the results, but whether they fit the conceptual mold. Um, so the Keller conjecture is, you know, kind of easy to dismiss in similar grounds. You know, that it uses SAT solvers and SAT solvers, at least the, the resolution of the, the, you know, whether or not it, it holds in seven dimensions. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, I, I quote a colleague who said, uh, you know, when I, when I told them about this, well, they said, you know, don't expect mathematicians to be interested. This is a finite computation. And I think the idea is, you know, if the final open question is, is it true in seven dimensions or not? You know, the mathematician's answer is yes. It's either true in seven dimensions or it's not, right? I mean, yes, there's a calculation. If you run your computer long enough, it'll tell you one way or another. But, you know, why bother? You know, what's the, what are we going to learn from it? Um, and that's not entirely fair because, you know, what we learned is that, I mean, there are lots of ideas that, that went into making it a feasible calculation, figuring it out how to control the search space, how to, you know, get the heuristic that, that could, um, that could uh, um, you know, get you the answer. But the point is that, you know, not that this isn't interesting, but that feels like computer science. It doesn't feel like, like mathematics. Um, the Kepler conjecture is, is a little bit harder to dismiss because, you know, it's, it was you know, a few hundred years of an open problem. Um, but here's a quote from, from a colleague uh, about this. So the context of this, well, this was just an email. It was a person in the email. I had written an essay about uses of computers in mathematics. And this colleague was trying to explain to me why the examples uh, that were discussed in, in, in that paper, in that essay, we're not compelling to mathematicians. Um, and so the, the colleague writes, for the purpose of this discussion, what I call a traditional mathematician is someone who has a permanent position that includes proving theorems. And what they, they do is try to get a conceptual and rigorous understanding of which mathematical statements are true. Uh, both adjectives are important, so conceptual and rigorous. Uh, to them, Hales's proof of the Kepler conjecture is nothing like solving the conjecture. And the Fleisberg project is purely computer science. That doesn't mean it's not interesting, it's something different, because at least part of what the proof lacks is the conceptual adjective. Right? You'll often hear mathematicians talking about their own proof, saying things like, there's nothing to understand here. It's only a computation. Right? This is the mathematician, yeah, trying to explain to me how mathematicians think. Well, so, so I, I suppose the colleague was trying to present this as, as, a, generic, as a generic view. This is, and, and, and we can discuss whether or not it is the generic view. But it was presented, here is, here is how mathematicians think. I, I think there's a substantial variation. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, OK, that's fair. But, uh, so, but at least there is a view out there that's coming in. And that, that's, uh, yeah, and that's what I, what I want to explore with this talk. Yeah. And again, he's saying, you know, that doesn't mean it's not interesting, right? I mean, it may be very good computer science, but as math, he's saying that as mathematics, this is not what I look for in a proof. This is not what, what, what I'm after. Okay. So finally, the, the result on uh, this, uh, higher dimensional sphere packing is the most interesting. Um, in preparing this talk, I, um, I, I looked at the paper. Um, and if you just, it's, you know, it's, it's in the annals. It's uh, the, 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 uh, the E8, Vyazovska's the, the first result. Uh, it's about a little bit more than 30 pages long, if I remember correctly. It's very, very computational. As you flip through the proof, you see things like, you know, using a simple computer algebra system, such as, you know, Parry GP or Mathematica, would can compute the first 100 terms of the Fourier expansion within a few seconds. What? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. But then, okay, but then, you know, there are all these identities, 32, 33, 34, there, uh, there are, uh, I mean, I, she's probably using a computer algebra, algebra system. In, in, in books, yeah. Okay, all right. 
Uh, but then you also get, you know, paper, there's a couple of graphs, right? She's graphing and there are plots and so on. And we observe that we can compute the values, you know, with any given precision. Um, and then finally, you know, the results require showing that something is bounded away from zero. Um, and, you know, there's a calculation, there's, there's interval arithmetic and so on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as Andrew says, this is, this is straightforward computer algebra calculation. Uh, um, but, you know, reading the paper, you get the sense that, you know, this is someone who really knows her way around a computer algebra system, is, is absolutely comfortable with these, these computational techniques. Um, so Henry Cohen has written a, a wonderful exposition of the results in the notices of the American Mathematical Society. I mean, it's, it's just a beautiful, you know, beautiful presentation. And what's interesting is that you don't get a sense of the, the, this kind of the, the level of computation in the paper from the essay. Um, and what the essay does, I think, you know, almost explicitly is, is kind of emphasize the, the, the conceptual aspect. So here are a number of quotes that I included in the essay. Um, so it's wonderful to see a relatively simple proof of a deep theorem in sphere packing. It's a notable contribution to the theory, the story of E8 and this, the story of exceptional structures in mathematics. Uh, it emphasizes the new connection between modular forms and discrete geometry. Um, instead of justifying spheres uh, by aspects of problem or its applications, we'll justify it by solutions. It's good if it has good answers. Uh, it turns out to be far richer and more beautiful topic than the bare problem statement suggests. The point of the subject is that is the remarkable structures that arise as dense sphere packings. Um, uh, emphasis modular form are deep and mysterious functions connected with lattices, uh, as are the magic functions, so it wouldn't make sense for them to be related. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so despite our lack of understanding, uh, the special load of eight and 24 dimensions, let's see, I think I, I really want to focus on the last line. These objects do not occur in isolation, but rather in constellations of remarkable structures. So the emphasis is, is not on the computation that went into the result, but the understanding of the structures and the connections between, between the, 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 the different branches of mathematics and the insights that, that went into it. Um, and one thing I found interesting was the, the picture of Iazovska that, that went, you know, the very first page of the art, I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but, you know, when you send a photographer to take a, a picture of a mathematician, I mean, the, the, you know, the cliche, the standard thing to do is, you know, you take a, a picture of the mathematician at the blackboard, you know, doing, doing some work at the blackboard. Um, so here's the picture that uh, went with the article. Uh, so there she she's sitting at the computer, you know, there's the, the, the pad, the coffee cup, you know, she's deep in thought. Uh, you know, it looks like, you know, it, was, it looks like it was a staged photo, but, you know, the, the I don't know if you can read the, uh, the caption, but the caption says, uh, you know, Marina Vyasovska solved the sphere packing problem in eight dimensions, right? So the suggestion is she's, she's doing sphere, but she's doing mathematics here. And that's right underneath the title where Henry is saying that, look, this is a conceptual breakthrough in sphere packing, right? So it's almost as though Henry is saying, look, this is conceptual, right? This is conceptual mathematics, right? But the photographer is saying, look, she's using a computer, okay? And so that, I think that juxt juxtaposition, and the two are not maybe necessarily, you know, mutually exclusive, right? But this is, this is what I want us to think about. That's kind of the relationship um, between the two. Okay, so, so I think I'm doing okay on time. So the point is that, you know, the results I discussed don't neatly fit our image of, of uh, at least conceptual mathematical understanding. They're not conceptual results. Um, and so, you know, the questions I wanted to raise in that essay are, you know, should we reconsider that image, right? Is there a way to think about mathematical understanding that kind of makes results like the ones I just described you know, more part of, of the picture of what it means to understand mathematics. And in particular, can we find ways of making room for computational results? Okay. And so to that end, let's now uh, try to get a historical perspective. So what I want to discuss is two older results, uh, one in Newton and one in Dirichlet, uh, and then try to draw some morals to it. So the first one I want to discuss uh, is, uh, is the inverse square law. So the story is that, you know, in 1609, uh, Kepler determined that, that, that planets travel in ellipses with sun at the focus. So, you know, Tycho Brahe took, took the data, Kepler analyzed the data and, data and determined, you know, we're looking at ellipses with the sun at the center. And a centerpiece of uh, the Principia Math the, you know, the, the Principia Mathematica, Newton's Principia Mathematica, was what's known as the Propositio Kepleriana, which is, um, you know, if you assume the laws of motion, uh, and you're given that the path uh, of a body is an ellipse, and the only force acting on it is directed to one focus of the ellipse, right? The question is, what is, what is the magnitude of the force that produces elliptical motion? 
right? And the answer is that it's, uh, it's um, inversely proportional to the distance from the focus. Right? So it's the inverse square law. So this is what scientists refer to as an inverse problem, right? You're given the effects and you're trying to reason for the causes, right? Given that, that the planets are moving in ellipse, what is the force law that accounts for it, right? And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's universal gravitation. So in other words, uh, you know, if you assume that some kind of force from the sun, the planet accounts for the motion, uh, he, he derived the, the magnitude of the force. That's the inverse square law. And um, so again, preparing for this talk, I kind of Googled around and found a presentation on the web. You know, in, in the Principia, it's demonstrated that Kepler, you know, the, the, the planets follow elliptical order that implies that the gravity follows an inverse square law. And here's a kind of a modern presentation of the calculation. You know, you use uh, polar, you know, polar coordinates and you take uh, derivatives and you do some calculations. Again, the details um, aren't so important, but you know, it's a two page, it's not an easy calculation. You have to know what you're doing. Um, but you know, this is what the calculation looks like today. Uh, but interestingly, um, he says is, you know, the fourth line down, he says, what follows is Newton's argument in modern notation. So now my question, how many of you have seen Newton's argument, Newton's presentation? Okay, well, so, so now, so you're in for a treat. So, so here it is, <laughs> this is Newton's, you know, and you see there's a big ellipse and there are lots of triangles and lots of lines. Um, and, you know, let S be the limit, draw, it looks like a, almost a proof in Euclid. Uh, there are, there's the parallel, there are equal angles and so on, and the, the, the lattice rectum, you know, parts of the ellipse. Um, and then, you know, you write down lots of, um, uh, you know, lots of equations and so on. And then there's a calculation and uh, a QEI, what does QEI stand for? I don't even know, but anyhow, that, 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 that's the proof in, in, in Euclid. Um, and so, Twice in the last decade, I've actually taught uh, a freshman seminar um, at Carnegie Mellon uh, with freshmen in the College of Humanities uh, and Social Sciences, not, not even math majors, where on you know, history and philosophy of mathematics. And we spent, each time we spent three weeks uh, working through the Principia up, up to this point. You can make sense of this. You can read it. I mean, I actually said it, it, reading all mathematics is hard, but you can do it. Um, there, there are lemmas in Newton. There's, there, are, there are two facts about ellipses that he, he cites from Apollonius. There are two identities that you need. There's, a, I mean, Newton develops a method of, there's kind of a graphical way of getting uh, an area, getting some you know, geometric quantity that's proportional to the force. Uh, and then you're reasoning about you know, that geometrical quantity. Um, but, uh, um, but you can do it. Um, and let me think. Yeah, and so, um, uh, I, I, so to that end, I recommend, uh, I'd like to recommend to you two books. So one is, 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 is really great. So Dana Densmore has written a guide to reading uh, the Principia, not the whole thing, but the but, you know, key parts of the argument, including, including the Propositio Kepleriana. Uh, and it's just kind of a, you know, she, she kind of presents the main text, you know, in Newton, and then kind of goes through the steps and gives you some, some, some background explanation. Um, and then there's a wonderful book by uh, Nicola Guicciardini called Reading the Principia. And as the title suggests, it starts with, with, with Newton and also Leibniz, their initial presentations of the calculus. But the book uh, mostly is about then subsequent authors and how they interpreted it and how they developed it and, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so they're both, um, 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 yeah, really quite good. But the historical story is that, you know, when you read early algebra, it's really striking, you know, the extent to which you, know, you realize that algebra was really fundamental about geometric magnitudes and constructions, right? So, you know, when you multiply x times y, you're, you're looking at the area of a rectangle with sides x and y. Right? And when you talk about x squared, you're talking about the area of a, of a square on x, right? So it really is, everything is explicitly uh, geometric. Um, and, you know, in, in that line, uh, so in the, six, in, in the 1630s, you know, Descartes' huge contribution was to show that you could use symbolic algebraic methods to solve uh, you know, hard geometric problems. And the idea is, you, know, you, you take the, the problem, you try the construction that you're trying to do, you label things, you, you label the thing that you're looking for x, uh, and then you write down equations and you solve the equations. But the notable thing is in Descartes, when you solve, solve the equation, you're not done, right? You get an equation for x, x equals blah, blah, blah. And then what do you have to do? You have to go back and do the geometric construction. Right? The problem is to find a geometric construction, and algebra is just a tool that helps you find the geometric construction. Uh, and so, you know, in 1666, that was, uh, you know, Newton's first uh, miracle year, 
Uh, that was when you know, plague is raging across the land and he goes to the countryside. Uh, and that's when he, he develops the symbolic version of the calculus with the dot notation, the fluxions and fluence and so on. And there is a fairly you know, algebraic development of the calculus. Uh, but very soon after that, he becomes very critical of the use of algebra in that way and very, very critical of Cartesian methods explicitly for obscuring mathematical understanding. He's very clear that unless you, you, you reason, you're reasoning geometrically from the diagram, you're not understanding. And so when he goes back and he writes the, the Principia, it's in the style, it's in the geometric style uh, I described. Um, and so here's, here's an interesting thing. So as I mentioned, um, Guicciardini's book then looks at uh, authors, how they responded to it. So when, uh, uh, you know, when Newton published the Principia, uh, so Christian Hawkins was, was 14 years senior to him. Uh, and Hawkins was a towering figure in, in, you know, in, in 17th century science. Um, and his, he responded, he wrote you know, a, a response to, to the Principia, and he's very critical of Newton for not being geometric enough, from straying for the geometric intuition. And there are a number of criticisms, but one of them is this. So Newton, in, uh, on the second page of the proof, he, he often multiplies A over B times C over D is A times C over B over D, right? For Hawkins, you can't do that. Okay, so, you know, in Euclid, if you look in book five of Euclid, there's the theory of ratios. And that's where, you know, Euclid tells you how to reason about uh, A, the pair of magnitude A and B, and the pair of uh, uh, ratios uh, of, of magnitude C and D having the same ratio, right? So A and B are magnitudes. Don't think of A over B as a number. Think of the, you know, saying A over B equals C over D is really a four place relation. It says, you look at these magnitudes and you look at these magnitudes and they bear the same relations to one another. Right? That's how you're supposed to do the theory of proportions, right? So if you're trying to um, uh, you know, multiply two fractions, the only thing you can really do is multiply A over B times B over C. And by definition, the answer is A over C. So the idea is you've got A, B, C, you can compare A and B, you can compare B and, B and C, or you can just forget about B and compare A and C. Right? This is something you can do geometrically. So you know, if you wanna multiply A over B times C over D, well, what you're supposed to do is construct an F such that you know, B over F is equal to C over D. Okay? And so now you're multiplying A over B by B over F, and the result is A over F. Right? And, you know, and, and uh, Halkins goes back to Newton's arguments and corrects them, says here's how you should have done it. Right? And this is really, I mean, this seems crazy. I mean, we, look at, we look at Newton and say, God, that is so geometric. Right? And, you know, and, and, and Hawkins is positively cranky that, you know, God, these kids today, you know, they're, it's all going to hell. You know, what is this multiplying fractions? Um, so you realize that, you know, what people expected out of mathematics is just, just different. The other example uh, I want to look at is uh, Dirichlet's theorem on primes in arithmetic progression. Uh, so it's a wonderful result. So it says that if you have, you know, an arithmetic progression where the first two terms have no factor in common, there'll be infinitely many primes in that, in that progression. So if you look at you know, the first sequence, 6, 15, 24, I mean, the first terms you know, share the common, uh, they're, they're, they're the common factor of three. So everything in the sequence is a multiple of three, so there won't be any primes there, right? The theorem predicts that in the contrary case, you know, like the second, where the first two terms have nothing in common, there will be infinitely many prime numbers. Um, uh, again, there's a wonderful history behind this. You know, Legendre proved quadratic reciprocity um, in 1798, with this in his, as an assumption. Um, and in the Disquisitiones, Gauss said, yeah, but, but Legendre you know, never proved this fact, and therefore he didn't prove quadratic reciprocity. So Gauss made a big deal that I'm giving you the first proof of quadratic reciprocity. Uh, Gauss, in his lifetime, he published six different proofs of quadratic reciprocity. Um, and uh, in his papers, you know, after, after, after he passed away, you know, there were two more proofs found. So, you know, Gauss kept reproving a quadratic reciprocity. He never proved the theorem on primes in arithmetic progression. And this is Gauss who never gave up on anything, right? So this is evidence that this is a hard problem. So in, when Dirichlet in 1837 gives a proof of this result, um, he's proving a, a longstanding open problem. But it's notable not only for that reason, but also for this sophisticated use of algebraic methods, which we'll talk about in a second. So this was a seminal moment in the development of algebraic number theory. And it's also a seminal moment in the development of analytic number theory. Right? So this is really one of the landmark mark results of the uh, 20th century, of the, of the 19th century, sorry. Um, and so, you know, modern presentations uh, uh, will tell you that, you know, the proof uh, you use uh, what are known as Dirichlet characters. 
So if G is a finite group, a character on G is just a homomorphism. It's, it's a non-zero homomorphism to the complex numbers. And you know, then there's an easy argument. There are two key orthogonality relations that give you a kind of Fourier, finite Fourier analysis or Fourier analysis on finite groups. Right? So if you fix a character and then sum the values over all the elements of the group, then they all cancel out. They sum to zero, uh, unless it's the trivial character that always returns one, in which case you're just counting the, the size of the group. And dually, if you fix an element and sum over the characters, um, they, uh, they, they'll all cancel out, unless it's the identity element of the group, in which case you're just adding one and counting the, the, the number of characters. Um, so modern proofs, you know, we'll say, the, uh, so what Dirichlet characters are, are characters specifically on the group of units modulo k, right? And the proof of Dirichlet's theorem, k is the common, is the, the difference in the arithmetic progression. And the proof, you know, you define Dirichlet L functions, they're functions that are parameterized by, uh, by, by the characters. Uh, and you write down, you know, a sum, there's a sum product. Uh, uh, there's, uh, so summing over reciprocals of natural numbers, it's, there's an identity that relates that to a product uh, over, uh, over a quantity involving uh, primes. Um, and then again, the, you know, number theorists, this will familiar, you take, you know, you, you take logarithms of both sides, you do approximations, and then you sum over characters and things cancel out. Again, if you haven't seen this before, don't worry about it too much. The interesting thing about contemporary proofs is that you can do all of this without knowing how to name or describe or calculate any particular character, right? So you can show, you teach this theorem to an undergraduate um, and, and then say, so can you name a character on, you know, a modulo 100? And they'll light up and they'll say, well, of course, there's the trivial character, right? And then you say, okay, can you name another one? And then, you know, they'll start looking uncomfortable. Right. But you can do it, right? So if, for example, the common difference is a prime number, right, then you're talking about the group of units modulo p, so it's, you know, the, the residues that are not divisible by p, so that's as order p minus one. And uh, we know that that's a cyclic group, uh, so you can pick an element of generator c. Uh, and then the character has to map c to some value. Oh, saying that it's a generator means that, you know, uh, everything that's not, any n that's not divisible by p, you know, can be represented as c to some index, so we'll call it gamma n. Uh, the character chi has to map uh, uh, c to something, to some value omega, and it's going to be a p minus first root of unity in the complex numbers. Uh, and so, you know, that determines the whole character. Right? So every character, uh, you know, gives, you know, is, is, is determined by, um, by, uh, by, um, uh, by a p minus first root of unity. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Right, so you can enumerate all the characters by enumerating all the p minus first roots of, of you know, complex roots of one. Um, and that's easy to do. I mean, just take, you know, take a generator. I mean, in the complex plane, you can take the one with the smallest angle and, you know, and, and then the characters, you know, correspond to, to the powers of that. And so you can take the power of capital Omega to be the index for the uh, L series. So you can write L M of S if you want to be more explicit. That's, you know, that's the, uh, the L series corresponding to uh, uh, the choice of character that corresponds to the root capital omega to the N. If the common difference is not prime, uh, the same, you know, the, the same sort of idea, you know, you can take the group that you're interested in to decompose it into a product of cyclic groups. You choose uh, um, uh, each generators for each cyclic group. Uh, uh, then a, a unit N modulo K has indices in that group. Um, each character corresponds to a choice of roots of unity for, you know, corresponding to the generators. You, so you fix them, take powers. And so in a similar way, you can characterize the L functions as, you know, the particular indices that you choose to get the roots that correspond to the generators. And I think, you know, some of the number theorists now are, might be getting a little bit uncomfortable. Like, what am I doing here? Why, why, am I, what, what, why would anybody want to do this? Right? And this is actually the point. This, this isn't me. This is Dirichlet. This is exactly what Dirichlet does in that remarkable 1837 paper. And I'm sorry that the image isn't good. I, again, I got this on the web, but you can see it. So in the case where he first does the case where uh, the, the common difference is prime, and you can see the L0, L1, L2, and you take the logarithms and you add them up and you add multiply by capital omega. So that's you know, the, the, the conjugate characters. You, know, you do the summation that way. Here, when you move to the more general modulus, you say, you know, write K as a product of primes. Uh, he's very explicit about the generator. I mean, so, you know, if the residues corresponding, you know, the components corresponding, you know, P to a power, uh, again, that's cyclic, uh, and, you, you know, choose uh, the roots. Uh, if the component, uh, 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 the power of two is greater than or equal to three, you need two generators. 
Uh, and you know, uh, Deerslate tells you, you, know, you can take them to be minus one and five. Uh, and so there you have all these, you know, there, that's all the data I described. And then you look through the calculations and you know, there's the sums and the products and the alphas and the omegas, the, the, the so on, right? And the text tells you what the, the summations and the products are over. And you know, there's a, uh, you take logs of both sides and again, they're still there. And here now you're summing over the characters. I mean, those, those are the expressions that, that he's working with. And so uh, about 10 years ago, um, Rebecca Morris was a PhD student uh, at the time. Uh, she and I did a study of the history of Dirichlet's theorem. And we had the pleasure of just reading a history of, of subsequent proofs, presentations of, of Dirichlet's proof and proofs of related results. Um, and the best way to describe it, so we started with, uh, you know, with Dirichlet's. Uh, the last one we looked at was a presentation by Landau in 1927 in just sort of an elementary number theory textbook. And the 1927 presentation looks just like any one that you would read today. Okay, so that's, and, you know, and after that, the presentations all look pretty much like that. And the best way to describe what we saw is that it was really a, a what was it, 90 year history of going from Dirichlet's presentation to the modern one. So people very quickly realized that you can modularize and abstract the property of the characters and get the orthogonality laws um, and, uh, you know, kind of get a more conceptual, you know, suppress the calculational detail. But nonetheless, they were still went out of their way to give you the explicit descriptions of the characters and the notation, you know, the argument, it always kind of kept close ties to, to the representations. So, yeah, so this is what he said. So, the, so again, people quickly realized that you could, you know, you could make the proof a lot clearer, um, but the representations, uh, you know, are always explicitly there. And so, you know, it, when you read the proofs, you get the sense that the thing with the proofs are fundamentally about symbolic expressions, you know, even though over time the, the expressions become hidden in the presentation. Um, it was a long time before, you know, before you know, the, the mathematical community felt that, okay, you can present this theorem and not explicitly describe the characters. But for a long time, they're, they're, they're there. Okay. So I think, again, I think I'm still doing okay on time. So, oh, let's see. So I think I had the wrong one. I wanted these to appear <laughs> um, uh, block by block. Okay, I think I just sort of copied the wrong, the, the handout version of the, the slides. I apologize. Anyhow, uh, the, the first moral I wanted to draw from this is that views of time, views of understanding change, right? So, you know, as we've seen, it was once a common view that mathematics, a common view among the mathematical elite, right? That the mathematics is fundamentally about geometric magnitudes and that a geometric understanding is essential to mathematics. Um, and, you know, we no longer think that way. Um, in the 19th century, I think it was a common view that mathematics is fundamentally about symbolic representations and calculation. And, you know, we can find more clever ways to do that and, you know, get further, um, but that ultimately a conceptual understanding is essential to mathematics. If you haven't understood the mathematics in computational, if you don't know how to get to the representations, you haven't really fully understood. Um, and um, um, again, I've had, you know, the conversations with, with let's say Kevin isn't here. Yeah, I've had conversations with Kevin Buzzard on this topic a couple of times. And every time, you know, he'll say to me, but Jeremy, we don't think that way anymore. And I say, yes, Kevin, I know, right? Because now, you know, today it's the common view is that mathematics is fundamentally about abstract structures and relationships between them. And that a conceptual understanding is essential to mathematics. And so the first observation is, you know, attitudes change. And so, you know, our current view may, may change as well. The second moral I want to draw from the story um, is that changes um, in mathematics don't happen suddenly, right? It's, uh, it, it's not like, you know, philosophers go up into the mountains and have a vision, they come down and say, oh, guys, we've had it all wrong. This is what mathematics is really about. Uh, it's not about, you know, one charismatic, you know, mathematician waking up one day and saying, hey guys, yeah. let's, let's do this. Let's, let, let's think about the infinite or let's do it this way. Um, whenever the mathematical community is faced with, with methodological change, um, there's this process. Um, there's a process of, of thinking about the new methods, asking, you know, are, the are they meaningful? Do they answer the questions that, that, that we're trying to answer? Do they do it appropriately? You know, what are the benefits to using the new methods? What are the drawbacks? What are, you know, what are we gaining? Uh, 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 what are we losing? And then there's a process of, you know, trying to preserve 
you know, what we had before um, and, you know, and still reconciling it with, with you know, the changes. Um, and so, that you, so you, I mean, the benefits are always that you're getting new mathematical insights. They're, they're enabling you to solve problems that you could not solve before. They're giving you new questions, right? So the, the gains are, are, are usually, you know, pretty clear. Um, but there's a process of trying to sort of adapt the new methods and, and you know, uh, and, and make sure that it's okay. So that, that, that doesn't happen easily. Um, and the third moral um, that, uh, uh, that um, uh, I wanted to convey uh, is that, you know, when this happens, it's not a matter of rejecting the past, right? So, you know, today we can still look back on, on Euclid, we can still look on Principia and say, look, th those were landmark works. They're great mathematical insights. It's not that they were wrong. It's that, that you know, now we have a, 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 a bigger conception of what geometry is and what geometry is about. And within that conception, we can recognize the, the power of what Euclid did and what the power of, of, of what Newton did. Okay, so it's not that we're, we're, we're rejecting the past, it's that we're embedding it in sort of a broader uh, understanding. Okay. Similarly, computation is, is still fundamental to mathematics, but the thought is mathematics isn't about computation, it's about getting a conceptual understanding within which we can make sense of what we're computing. Okay, so those were the, the morals that, uh, um, um, that I wanted to, uh, uh, um, uh, that in that essay that I kind of drew from the historical, um, uh, the historical uh, uh, examples. So finally, because I've got such a wonderful platform here and such a wonderful audience, so let me kind of conclude with uh, uh, some, some bigger morals. Um, so the first one is, um, I'd like to you know, make the case, first of all, for the value of, of studying the history of mathematics. Um, so, you know, I've, I've led a really charmed career. So my, my um, undergraduate degree and my, my PhD are both in, in mathematics. Uh, but at Carnegie Mellon, my primary appointment is in the philosophy department. Um, and in recent years, uh, almost all of my publications uh, and my students have been you know, publishing in computer science. Um, but one of the great pleasures of, of my career is having the opportunity to, to, to spend some time with the history of mathematics and learn something about the history of mathematics. And most people don't have that opportunity. So this is something that's really fundamentally changed the way I think about mathematics. Um, and it's not just you know, that it, it helps us to understand you know, how we got to be here, but it helps us appreciate why we're so lucky to be here, right? I mean, you know, when you look at the history of mathematics, you're looking at, at you know, 2,000 years of the most powerful, beautiful ideas that, that humankind has, has come up with. And you know, so this gives you a way to really appreciate these ideas and, and you know, why, why they are so, so, so valuable. Um, and as I said, you know, there, in this, in, you know, in North America, there are very few working historians of mathematics. It's not really a, a discipline. Um, it's not, you know, it's not history. It's not mathematics. I mean, philosophy departments often, you know, do a hi history of science, but even history of science usually doesn't include history of mathematics. So, you know, there's usually the, something that people expect you just to do, you know, um, in their part time. Um, but, you know, if we could find some way so like if every math department had just one person who was teaching the history of math class and you know, could, could maybe spend some time you know, studying the history of mathematics and get credit for it, right? So you know, maybe this is part of the hiring decision, this is part of promotion that you know, if they've got, you know, in addition to whatever other work they're doing, if they've got a couple of papers, you know, that this counts. Um, I mean, th there would be a trade-off, right? You're kind of, they're a little bit less contemporary results, but if we could find some way to support it and credit it, I think, our students would benefit, um, and I think the discipline as a whole would benefit as well, because it really is, is a wonderful history. And we can learn a lot from it. Um, the, um, the second uh, uh, moral I want to draw is uh, make a case for the value of, uh, of philosophy, or at least philosophical reflection on, on what we're doing. So in, um, in, uh, uh, you know, in the sciences, there's some time to add to that. To be a successful scientist, you know, I mean, you basically have to just shut up and measure another neuron, right? It's really just kind of taking more data and, you know, and doing the experiments and, and the modeling. Um, and over the summer, I read a book by Michael Strevens that really <laughs> does, uh, does I, I think, is kind of gives a philosophical argument that, <laughs> yep, that's right. That's, that's you know, that's the, the great value of the science. Um, I mean, he talks about, you know, the iron rule of science, that the idea that, you know, in scientific debate, ultimately the only thing that counts is empirical results, right? That the only, you know, if you're having, if, if scientists, if, if, there, if there's a debate, the only thing that, that counts, the only thing that matters um, is the data, right? The only thing to appeal to. Uh, and so here's kind of an extreme quote, 
where he's kind of responding to uh, things that um, uh, C.P. Snow and E.O. Wilson had written. Uh, and he says that, you know, it's a mistake to think that uh, science would flourish if scientists knew and cared more about the rest of existence. Quite the contrary. Their obliviousness, their obliviousness is the greatest guarantee that they will follow without deviation the empirical path laid, uh, laid out by the iron rule. And so this is kind of an extreme formulation of this. Um, I will leave it to scientists and philosophers of science to, philosophers of science to argue this. But I want to I make the case that in mathematics, this is not right. Um, because the data is, you know, we're not, I mean, the, uh, so every time we wake up in the morning and decide what to work on, right, we're making a philosophical decision as to what counts, what, what we should be doing, what, what, uh, what is valuable for mathematics. And this comes to play, you know, every time we decide what to teach and how to teach it, every time we write a book, we write an article, um, every time we review an article, we're giving just judgments, not only is the mathematics correct, but is this an important result? Should this be published? Uh, every time a, a department comes together and they decide who to hire, the argument is this, per is this person doing something important? Okay. Uh, so when we, when we bestow awards. Okay. Um, and so, you know, these, these are fundamentally philosophical judgments as to what makes for good mathematics. And I often feel that we're not very good about talking about things like this, right? The discussions we have, they're kind of, you know, they're kind of, kind of, kind of fuzzy. Um, and so, I mean, the point is that uh, this is important, and, and it's a different skill from proving theorems. I mean, so, you know, when, when we, we look at field metal, fields medalists, you know, we value their, their technical skills, their technical expertise, right? But we also admire their vision, right? We look for, Akshay, tell us what's important to mathematics. Where is the field going, right? We look for, we look, you know, we expect mathematicians to give us uh, a, a vision. So this is, this is important. Um, and so we should be better uh, at talking about it. When I was, um, um, uh, so I was an undergraduate at Harvard, and I used to um, uh, enjoy biking out to uh, Walden Pond. So remember, so Walden Pond was where, uh, in the 1840s, uh, the great uh, philosopher, essayist uh, Thoreau, uh, he built a cabin in the woods. And you can still find the site where he built this cabin. You can find a sign there. And I found, I, here's, a, here's a picture of the sign. So the quotation is, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to, to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. And I really like this, this, this I mean, this has really stuck with me all this time. I really like this idea of, of living de deliberately, right? I mean, for the most part, we do what we're supposed to do. We do what we're expected to do. We do, we do what we're trained to do, what we're taught to do. And, you know, Thoreau was telling this, every once in a while we should detach and, and think about, you know, are we doing what we should be doing? Just so that, you know, one day when we look back on it, we can say, yes, I, 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 I did what, what, what I wanted to do. And so my message to you is that, you know, we should live our, our mathematical lives deliberately. We should, uh, 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 and that involves, you know, thinking about it and talking about it and, and you know, coming to, to venues like this to, to talk about mathematics. Okay, but the last thing I want to do, the thing I want to conclude with um, is just um, a, uh, 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 a note of optimism. So there are, um, uh, you know, change is hard. And I think there are legitimate reasons to be concerned about how computers um, might change mathematics. And there's the feeling that everything we love about the subject might, might go away. I mean, computers might, uh, might, might just fundamentally change the subject so that, you know, it's the, the, the things we like about it are, are just gone. Um, so ultimately, though, it's a technology and we get to, to decide how to use the, the technology. Um, so that's, that's some good news. But then you might worry, well, you know, how, what's the guarantee that we're going to make the right decisions? Um, and the answer is we're not, right? We're going to make mistakes. We're human. Um, but this is where, you know, historical and philosophical reflection helps. When you take the long view of mathematics, you get the sense that mathematics knows what it's doing. We don't know what it's doing. We're muddling along, right? But, but mathematics knows what it's doing, uh, which is to say, the forces that drive mathematics are fundamental and they're powerful and they're robust. Right? Mathematics will get past the mistakes we make. And so we shouldn't be afraid to um, explore along the way. Um, I mean, these days, you know, there are a lot of things that, that, we, can be, that we can be worried about. You know, I, I mean, I, we should worry about you know, uh, economic and political divisions. Uh, global warming, uh, there's uh, uh, the next pandemic, there's war, there's the threat of nuclear weapons. If you want to lose sleep at night, 
there are lots of things that we can be gravely concerned about. Mathematics um, is, not, is not one of them. One thing we can be sure of is that, you know, as long as the species survives and continues to do mathematics, future generations will understand things better than we do now. And they'll be thinking about things in ways that we can't even imagine. And whether or not we'll be around to see it, we should be encouraged because that's exactly why we do mathematics. Thank you very much.